Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. We pray that your spirit be mightily present and will touch every heart and impart the virtues of Christ in the life and heart and ministry of everyone. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight, we're coming to James chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 1. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, if ye fulfill the royal law, According to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Ye do well. Verse 9. But if ye have respect of persons, ye commit sin. If ye have respect of persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors in verse 10 it says for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point he is guilty of all verse 11 for he that says do not commit adultery said also do not kill now. If thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Verse 12. So speak ye, and so do you, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Verse 13. It says, for he shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy. And mercy rejoices against judgment. Tonight, as we come to this passage, the Lord is reminding us that we need to live by the royal law of liberty. The topic tonight is living by the royal law in the Lord. Come back to verse 1. In verse 1 it says, my brethren. It was talking to brethren, brothers and sisters in the Lord. Who are brethren? Who are brothers and sisters in the Lord? Those who belong to the Lord and to the Lord's family. They do not belong to Satan. They will not be brethren. They do not belong to this world. He said, I chose you out of the world. If they were still of the world, they will not be brethren. They do not belong to themselves. If they were self-centered and self-willed and self-focused and looking for self and dealing with self, and ministry to self every time they will not be brethren they are the people who have repented they have repented thoroughly they have repented completely they have repented from all sins of their past life haven't let the sins of the past and haven't let all the evil common sins and the peculiar sin and the evil of their lives did not believe on the lord jesus christ and now they are sons and daughters of God. That's what God said. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord. Those are the brethren. My brethren, the brethren of the apostles, the brethren of the people of God, the people that believe the same Lord, they follow the same Lord, and they obey the same word of God. Those are the brethren. And you must check up 
Are you a brother? Are you a sister? Have you repented? Repented from your past? Have you repented from everything you have been used to? Living in sin? You will not be a brother. You will not be a sister. Living in all the evil and the transgressions of the world, you will not be one of the brethren. But it says, if you have repented, if you have believed on the Lord, if you have become a new creature in Christ, you are saved. Those are brethren. Maybe you've gone forward beyond salvation. You're sanctified. You're purified. Your heart is poured and your life is renewed. You are a brother. Maybe you've gone beyond salvation, sanctification. You're filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in the Holy Ghost, energized, empowered by the Holy Ghost, by the virtue of the fact that the Spirit of God remains in you, abides in you, and leads you and controls you in everything you do, private, public, at home, in church, everywhere. You become part of the family of God, my brethren. Have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. You have the nature of the Lord. You have the character of the Lord. And as he was impartial, you become impartial as well. As he was faithful to the word, he was righteous. So you become righteous, and so you do not have uh, the respect of persons of partiality. And you're dependable, you're trustworthy, and your life is straightforward. No hypocrisy, there's no dishonesty, there's no disobedience, there's no private public sin, nothing. Now you have the faith of the Lord and you hold that faith with all your heart and with all sincerity. You are following the Lord of glory. You are living according to the standard of the word of God. Don't have the faith of Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons, living by the royal law in the Lord. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, we're looking at the righteous Lord of laws with redemptive persons. Number two, we're looking at the royal law of love for the royal priesthood. And then number three is the renewed law of liberty for all regenerated people. We're coming to number one. Number one is the righteous Lord of Lords. The Lord of Lords with redemptive precepts. Look at that James chapter 2 again, verse 1. It says, my brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Three things we look at in this point. Number one, number one, the impartiality of Christ in his teaching. Number two, the invariability of Christ as the teacher. Number three, the inflexibility of Christ even in tough times. Tough times will come for everyone. It came to Christ. He had no sin yet. He had suffering. He had no sin yet. Temptation came. He had no sin yet. Troublous times. Tough times came. So after we are saved, children of God, we are not going to go to heaven on a bed of roses. Difficulties might come, challenges might come, tough times might come, and times of temptation, trial, even local tribulation might come. But he wants us to understand that as Christ was inflexible, an impartial, invariable, at the time of his own tough trials, which you have been the grace of God saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost in those tough times, will remain like Christ 
inflexible. Look at number one. Number one is the impartiality of Christ in his teaching. The impartiality of Christ in his teaching to the young, to the old, impartial. To the religious, to the irreligious, impartial. To those who are rulers among the people of the nation and to those who are peasants, ordinary people, impartial. He taught the same thing. Look at John chapter 3. We're looking at verse 1. John chapter 3 verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. What did he teach him? What did he tell him? Look at verse 2. In verse 2, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, Master, we know that thou... Do ...these miracles that doest except God be was he it's the life of jesus righteous cool-headed not blown away by flattery we know you you're a teacher come from god from heaven and for a pharisee to say that and for a ruler among the pharisees to say that that was something that all the Pharisees were against Christ, and all the Sanhedrin against Christ, and here comes one of them, here comes one of their leaders, and he said, we know that flattery can blow some people away, that they forget to tell the truth, to teach the truth, to instruct in the way of righteousness. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, Jesus now answered and said unto him verily verily i say unto thee except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of god that impartiality is what we need today on the pulpit and in counseling anywhere we find ourselves we have to instruct we have to teach we have to counsel we have to preach we have to evangelize be uniform in the word that were given that except a man be born again whoever the man may be might be a ruler among the jews whoever he must be born again before he can see the kingdom of god matthew chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 1 in matthew chapter 5 verse 1 and seeing the multitudes they went up into a mountain and when he was set his disciple came unto him look at verse 20 in verse 20 for i say unto you he was preaching to the multitude he was talking to the people that have you know various status and position in society and yet all of them without exception he said except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of God. As he said to them at that time, he's saying to us, he's saying to you, he's saying to me, he's saying to the preacher, he's saying to those, you know, at the pew that accept our righteousness individually shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. We shall in no way, in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 18, reading from verse 3. And said, Verily I say unto you, he was talking to his own disciples here. They had been arguing and wondering who will be the greatest among us. Like many people wonder today, I mean, this section of the church, I mean, that section of the work, which one is greater? Which one is more important? I am a leader, I'm a follower, I'm a member, I'm a minister. 
who is greater, Jesus now said unto them, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child. Peter was there, John was there, James was there, Matthew was there. Those disciples were there and he preached the same thing unto them. And he said, yes, your disciples, yes, your apostle, understand this, chapter 18 of Matthew, in chapter 10, he had sent them out two by two. And those people had gone out two by two, and they had cast out devils, and they had healed the sea. And yet he tells them, because he was impartial in his teaching, he said, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Luke chapter 13, we're looking at verse 3. Luke 13, verse 3, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. As I spoke to them at that time, he's speaking to you. He's speaking to me. Are we just in the church? We were invited. We came in. And then, as we look at how the people in the church, how they dress, how they look, how they talk, how they walk, how they bend, how they bow, and what meeting they come, so we copy them. That's not enough. That is not enough. A point must come in your life that you say, on this day, at this time, I realized I was a sinner. I realized that all the good exterior, all the polished exterior will not take me to heaven. And then you come at a definite time and you bend before the Lord. That's when you surrender your heart your life unto the Lord, and you deliberately repent of everything you remember you have done, and you bundle everything together, and you say, Lord, I have done evil. I will do no more. I turn away from them. I repent of them, and I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Spirit of God in a definite way bears witness with your heart, that you are a child of God. And your life becomes different from then. I must ask you, do you know the day? Do you know the time? Do you know the place? I can still see the place where I knelt down, where I repented, and turned away from my sin. Many years ago, but it's still as real as if it happened today. That must happen to you because I tell you except ye repent ye shall all likewise perish and look at verse 22 in verse 22 it tells us and he went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem, verse 23. In verse 23, then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, verse 24, strive to enter in at the straight gate. Enter in. When you enter through a door, it's a definite step. It's a definite experience. You know, you are outside. You decided to enter. You took action. You entered. And you entered in. You are outside. After entering in is when you come inside. The same thing with the kingdom of God. You are outside the kingdom. You are in sin. You are in transgression. You are in iniquity. You took a definite step. 
you made up your mind, you decided that is the door, repentance and faith in Christ that leads into the kingdom. And you took that step and Jesus said, strive to enter in at the straight gate for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able to seek the Lord today while you can find him. Look at number two. Number two is the invariability of Christ as the teacher. Invariable. He taught the same thing at the beginning and at the end. And even when he had gone to heaven and was going to talk to the church, the seven churches in Asia Minor, he didn't change his message. That same message invariable. We're looking at John chapter 3 and we're reading there from verse 2. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. We know thou art a teacher come from God. If a teacher comes from God, and he gets his message from God. God says, I'm God, I change not. His standard does not change. The scriptures do not change. The message from heaven, from God, does not change. If this teacher came from God, that means his message will be the same. It will not be, you know, changing from day to day, changing from climate to climate, changing from congregation to congregation, changing from nation to nation. It came from God. Look at verse 34. In verse 34, it says, For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God. The Lord was sent by God. Jesus was sent by God. And because the God who sent him changes not, he himself sent by God changes not. He says, he speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. What that means is, he gives the Spirit to him without measure. Sent by God, saturated by the Spirit, the words he preached remained the same. Uh, that's what the Lord is expecting of us. Matthew chapter 22, reading from verse 16 in Matthew 22, verse 16. And they sent unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, master they called him master was he master yes he told his disciples he called me master and lord he say, well for so am i although these were people that came to tempt him they were telling the truth when they said master we know that thou art true that's true that's what nicodemus said we know you that you are true and teaches the way of God in truth. Teaches the way of God in truth. The way of God is the way of truth, is the way of righteousness, is the highway of holiness, and it does not change. If we are following after the Lord, we need to have that same character and that same consecration and that same commitment that the Christ will follow. It's not a Christ that will daily dally. The Lord that will change for the wind. And the Lord that will be looking at the faces of people and then tailoring his message to their mood. They said, we know that thou teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man. Neither carest thou for any man. There are people that care too much about what man will do to them, what man 
will, you know, plan against them. And because their mind is not on God, their mind is not on the word. Their mind is not on the truth. They are always thinking of, what are they planning against me? What are they conspiring there against me? They're too much self-conscious. But Jesus Christ was invariable. Why could he be invariable? Because he cared for no man. For thou regardest not the person of men. That the character we ought to have, we need to become so solid in our conviction. And we need to become more stable in our character. We need to become more steadfast in the things we believe so that we're not looking at people, we're not, you know, gauging what they will do, what they will not do, how they will act. That is what makes us to be invariable, inflexible, like Christ. Look at number three here. Number three is the inflexibility of Christ even in tough times. If you have not gone through tough times in your Christian life, soon you will. If you have not been confronted by tough people, tough people, who challenge you face to face in your Christian life, soon you will. Jesus Christ, he went about doing good. The people didn't mind about the good he was doing. He healed the sick. He cleansed the lepers. He raised the dead. He cast out devils. But all those Pharisees and what concerned them about those miraculous works were not concerned about that. He even opened the eyes of somebody that was born blind, and that fellow, they saw him, and he said, how did your eyes get open? He said, a man made clay, and then he put on my eyes and sent me to the pool of sight.